I'm Father Chris Alar, the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and it is always an honor to have you with us for Living Divine Mercy here on EWTN. Now, one topic that has always been of interest to mankind forever, but has especially had a heightened interest in recent times, is Christian prophecy. Now, a lot of this is justified because we have prophecy in the Bible. Our Lady brought us much prophecy at places like Fatima and Akita, but much of it also is um, equivalent to crystal balls and fortune telling. So what we want to do today is turn it over to Father Thaddeus as he tells us what really is Christian prophecy. We are Thank you again, Father Chris. This is Father Thaddeus, and I want to speak today on Christian prophecy. Now, that may seem like a strange title to you because we often associate prophecy with the Old Testament prophets, and we think about the Bible, the written word of God. But prophecy has not ceased in the church. And in fact, if we go to the Bible, 1 Corinthians 14, St. Paul clearly says this, make love your aim, because he had just spoken about how love is what will endure even to heaven, make love your aim and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, he who prophesies speaks to men for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. That's something that's important to unpack because if you look on YouTube today, you'll find all sorts of prophets saying any number of things. And especially as Catholics, we can be a little confused about what do I do with all of this? Because if we listen to various voices that are telling us to do this or prepare for that, then we maybe have lives that are very confused and we need to prepare and do all sorts of things and be unable to continue our daily routine and our daily duties. So what do we do with this idea of prophecy? Well, first is to recognize that it is a spiritual gift. That's why St. Paul mentions it. We keep in mind that the greatest gift of all and the essence of all holiness is love, is agape, is being like Jesus, willing to offer ourselves in love upon the cross. But he, of all the spiritual gifts, all the charisms that he lists in previous chapters in his letter to the Corinthians, he specifically mentions prophecy. Now, I want to clear up before I continue. Prophecy does not simply mean predicting the future. That's what we often believe when we hear the word prophecy. People want some in into the future to know, you know, Father, what's going to happen tomorrow or in 10 days or in five years? And I remember my spiritual father in my own private conversation with him. He's a deacon in Southern Texas and has worked in a lot of exorcism ministries. So he's dealt with a lot of demons in his time, 10, 15 years now of exorcism ministry. And he was pretty firm with me because there are times I can get a little curious and wonder, you know, well, is this going to happen? Because I've kind of heard some things in prayer and other people have said this and, you know, maybe I'll be like this in a few years. And he would warn me and he would say, it's understandable to be worried and to be interested in the future, but be very careful because demons definitely want to capitalize upon our curiosity and to peer into the future. And they want to whisper things that may lead you astray. And St. Ignatius of Loyola gets into his rules of discernment. Father Timothy Gallagher has published two good books on the two different weeks of discernment that are very helpful in discerning spirits. And in his second book, he comments that we need to be careful because Ignatius says clearly, even the evil spirit can give consolation. Even he can use pious and religious words. And we have to remember, when Jesus was tempted in the desert, Satan quoted scripture. <laughs> Satan did not tempt Jesus by bringing him a prostitute or tempting him to drugs. He tempted Jesus by very holy means, but by twisting scripture in a way that God did not intend. So with that very negative warning, we need to be careful. Could God, of course, predict the future for us? Could he tell us? Because he lives in eternity. He sees all present already. Of course he can. But Cardinal Ratzinger, 
whom we know as Pope Benedict, wrote a beautiful preface to a book called Christian Prophecy, written by a Danish theologian, which is a little rare as a Catholic because Denmark is largely Lutheran, but Pope Benedict wrote this foreword to his book called Christian Prophecy. And in it, Pope Benedict summarizes his own theology about prophecy. And he clearly states prophecy is less about predicting future events in and of themselves as much as making clear what is God's word for us today. Why? Because if I hear what God is telling me today, then I know the path that I need to follow that will lead me to the future that he can describe. Which is why the prophets time and again in the Old Testament speak about conversion. If you do this, if you leave your ways, if you obey my word, if you heed my voice, then X, Y, Z, you will receive blessings, you will be restored, you will experience my peace. And on the other side, but if you fail to he heed my word, if you do not listen to my voice, then you will experience X, Y, and Z. And in that way, it's almost like being a parent. Parents have to tell their children, listen, if you do this again, then you will be punished. I remember when my dad had to tell me, Thaddeus, if you do that again, you will be grounded for a day. And sure enough, me being a teenager, you can only guess what I did in that time. <laughs> but prophecy in that sense is much like God being a good father. And that's why St. Paul, when he writes about prophecy here in 1 Corinthians 14, he says that he who prophesies speaks to men for their upbuilding and their encouragement and their consolation. Paul doesn't even mention speaking about the future. Rather, being a prophet is about knowing in prayer that there is a certain word that the Lord needs me to communicate to another person, which is why in the Catechism, when it describes Christ as prophet, it says that we share in his prophetic mission in evangelizing, in sharing the word of Christ with others. Now, on a very basic manner, very base value, that means we need to read the Bible as Catholics because I can't pretend to hear God speaking to me in the quiet of my heart if I don't pay attention to the way that he already has clearly spoken to the generations of prophets and through his son, Jesus Christ. And in fact, another warning is given by St. John of the Cross, which during the season of Advent, the priest read in the Office of Readings. St. John of the Cross says, we need to be very careful about looking for extra revelations from God. Why? Because in the letter to the Hebrews, St. Paul makes clear, God has already fully spoken now in his son. In various and fragmented ways, he spoke to us in the Old Testament through the prophets. Now he has spoken clearly through his son, and he goes so far, St. John of the Cross, as to say, it would actually be almost arrogance, and it would be tempting God to say, well, it's really cool what you did in Jesus Christ, and it's awesome that we have the Bible and all that the church teaches, but I need you to say something else because I'm not convinced. We need to be careful of that. Now, we know, here I am, I'm a Marian of the Immaculate Conception. The Lord appeared sometimes almost daily to St. Faustina and produced what we understand as the diary. So, of course, Jesus still reveals himself. He's not gone. He is our risen Lord who lives and is present to the church. But St. Faustina did not go around looking for these things. And in fact, if you read the diary, time and again, she actually wanted to escape it. <laughs> she even thought of praying the full rosary every day just so that she would avoid encountering Jesus appearing to her. And so we see the paradox. She actually did see Jesus, and she saw it almost as a burden because it entailed a lot of suffering on her part, a lot of sacrifice. As we see in the Old Testament, being a prophet entailed pain, suffering, and with Jesus, the prophet par excellence, it included his very crucifixion. We know what happens to people who speak the truth. It's usually not very pleasant things. So again, prophecy is about knowing God's word. And he's already spoken a lot. And we believe that the Bible, especially at mass, is his living word to us today. Which is why in the liturgy, for instance, at Christmas time, the opening antiphon is, today Christ is born. We don't say, oh yeah, 2,000 years ago he was born and we just remember that today. No, in the liturgy, this happens today. God is speaking to us today. And so God, of course, he doesn't stop speaking. 
in a theological perspective, I would say, you know, God as Father always speaks his word. It's not that he spoke his word and he's done or he will speak his word, but because he lives in eternity, he is always speaking his one word, that is Jesus Christ. And Jesus comes to us in so many different ways, through the Bible, through the Mass, through the sacraments, through the hierarchy of the church, through the bishops, because Jesus says, he who hears you hears me. But we have to pay attention to what God has already said and still says in the liturgy, because that will attune us to the ways that then God may indeed speak to, directly to our hearts. St. Ignatius of Loyola does say in his spiritual exercises that God can, because he is sovereign, speak directly to someone's heart. And that's possible for all of us. And so we do need to foster hearts that are capable of hearing what does God want to say. But we need also good spiritual directors because we need to discern. We can't, as John on the cross warned, we can't baptize everything we receive in prayer as always coming from God. Because as I said, the evil one can come in and even our own human nature has fallen and we can twist things too sometimes. But we need to be clear that our hearts ought to be open. We do share in the prophetic mission of Christ. As baptized Catholics, we are called to share his word. That is our duty. We are called to deepen our awareness of what the faith means in our lives and to share that faith with others. And that's not something that we should escape. We are responsible for the knowledge we have of the faith. And as prophets, we are called to speak it. And I know that's hard. I remember as a seminary novice, sometimes I'd go on the street and hand out miraculous medals or divine mercy cards, and I would get a variety of reactions depending on the person that I met. Sometimes people are very happy. Sometimes people don't want to hear a thing about Jesus. But we shouldn't ever stop speaking his name because as prophets, we're to bring Jesus close to others through his word. Now, I want to end by mentioning once more St. Faustina and the diary. The catechism does mention that there are private revelations. God does continue to speak to St. Faustina, St. Margaret Mary Alacoc, to other saints, and even to other people today that we perhaps could find on YouTube. But it is important that the church weigh in on these matters because she has the authority to discern whether this is taking away from what's called the deposit of the faith or whether this is helping us live our one faith in a way we need to do today. And that's what happened with the divine mercy. Jesus, in our times, wanted us to relearn the power of this message. May the Holy Spirit enlighten our hearts and give us courage to speak the words of Jesus to others and to be his prophets, to encourage and build up the people of God. Back to you, Father Chris. Well, thank you, Father Thaddeus. That's great wisdom and gives us a lot to think about. Now, tomorrow, February the 22nd, is a very important date. If you ask my father, he'll say yes, because in 1980, that's when the USA hockey team beat the Russians. But more importantly, February 22nd, 1931, was the date when Jesus first appeared to St. Faustina and gave her the pattern by which he wanted her to paint an image. We now know that image as the image of divine mercy. So now let's watch a clip from the movie, Love and Mercy, Faustina. Go at once to Warsaw. You will enter a convent there. The mystical experience of this young 19-year-old woman changed her life. In her heart, she knew that she was called to the religious life, but she did not want to oppose her parents. Now, she has no doubts. Praise be Jesus Christ. Now and forever. How can I help you? My name is Helena Kowalska. I would like to speak to the Mother General and ask her to let me enter the convent.
I want you to paint an image according to how you just saw me. But I can't paint. Right under it. Jesus, I trust in you. Don't be afraid. I will grant you a visible help. He will help you carry out my will on earth. Sister Faustina is incapable of painting this image. She is helpless. She has not met the confessor whom the Lord Jesus promised her. In two years, however, she is transferred to Vilnius. At the Stefan Batori University that Father uh, Zapochka taught for about four years, he was appointed uh, confessor to the congregation of the Sisters of Our uh, Lady of, of Mercy. And uh, there the following year, in 1830, he met uh, uh, Sister Faustina Kowalska and he became her confessor and spiritual father. Jesus told me that she will be my confessor. Sorry, who told you? Jesus. Jesus. Are you sure? Yes. I've been seeing him for a long time. He showed me you many months before I ever saw you. Is everything okay with your head, sister? Being a seasoned spiritual director, he knows how to proceed with such a penitent. That's why he first sends her to a psychiatrist. Only with the results of the psychological tests in hand and knowing that she is mentally healthy, he makes a decision. Sister, as I agreed to be your spiritual guide, I want you to disclose to me not only your sins, but also your thoughts, instigations of evil, and sisters' visions. Only then I could see what truly happens in your soul. I will reveal everything to your father. Jesus himself told me not to hide anything from you. Otherwise, he would hide from me. And he also said, you would help me to fulfill his will on earth. I understand. It is probably because of Father Sopochko that we have the diary of St. Faustina today. Not only helped her in discerning the meaning of the revelation of the image, but also found uh, Kazimierowski, the painter, uh, who painted the image that we know today as the original image of Divine Mercy. Jesus should appear out of the darkness. And those rays, I told you, they cannot be white and red like national flag, but pale and red like water and blood. Sister Faustina came to the painter's workshop once or twice a week for half a year. Despite many corrections, she was not happy with the image. Finally, a moment came when she accepted the work. Most important for her was that Jesus himself accepted it. Jesus said to Sister Faustina, not in the beauty of the color, nor of the brush lies the greatness of this image, but in my grace. And this is the most important thing. But the message is also important, the theological meaning that the image contains. 
The image of Jesus, the divine mercy incarnate, represents the Lord as coming forth from the Holy of Holies in heaven to ensure us of the forgiveness of our sins after having entered there to bring the offering of his life to the Father as the ransom. The dark background symbolizes the total darkness in the Holy of Holies of the earthly tabernacle, which was illumined only by God's presence as he received the atoning sacrifice. That scene of Christ's coming out of the Holy of Holies with rays emanating from his wounded side represent the blood and water, that is, the Holy Spirit, as the source of life handed over, according to St. John's Gospel, at the moment of his death. As one of the prayers of St. Faustina points out, You died, Jesus, but the source of life gushed out for the souls, and a sea of mercy opened up for the whole world. Now let's go to scripture, specifically Matthew 24. It is called the Little Apocalypse because it has a lot of Christian prophecy. So let's hear that reading from one of our employees, Matthew. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. We should view our Lord's second coming with hope, in St. Luke's Gospel, Jesus finishes one of his prophecies of the end times with the words, Now when these things begin to take place, look up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Here in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus promises that he will return to earth with power and great glory to usher in the final triumph of God and gather his people safely into his eternal kingdom. That is why the early Christians pray with hope and expectation, Come, Lord Jesus! The Lord's final return to judge the earth will be a time of reckoning and a terrible day of justice for the wicked and impenitent. But for his disciples, who are filled with trust in his merciful love, it will be a day of liberation and final homecoming. St. Faustina prays, Let the omnipotence of your mercy shield us from the darts of our salvation's enemies, that we may with confidence, as your children, await your final coming. For Jesus is our hope, through his merciful heart, as through an open gate, we pass through to heaven. I saw the Lord Jesus above our chapel, looking just as he did the first time I saw him, and just as he is painted in the image. The two rays, which emanated from the heart of Jesus, covered our chapel and the infirmary, and then the whole city, and spread out over the whole world. One of the girls, who was walking with me a little behind the others, also saw these rays, but she did not see Jesus, and she did not know from where these rays were emanating. After supper, the girl approached me and told me she had been so moved by these rays that she could not keep silent, but wanted to tell everyone about them. Yet, she had not seen Jesus. I prayed for her, asking the Lord to give her those graces of which she had such need. My heart rejoiced in the fact that Jesus takes the initiative to make himself known, even though the occasion of such action on his part causes me annoyance. For Jesus, one can bear anything. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And as Jesus said in his prophetic words to St. Faustina, I want every home to have this image of divine mercy. 
Now, we Marians took that seriously. So we, right here at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy, make these beautiful canvas gallery-wrapped images that if you are interested in getting one, uh, please see the information there on your screen. So please join us next week as we'll be talking about the importance and beauty of sacred music. So until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.